Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Go ahead and take a seat. Good morning, City Light. How are we doing? Good morning. Good morning. Hey, if you're new, please fill out the Connect card on your seat or on your neighbor's seat. We'd love to get to know you. We are in our second week of 21 days of prayer and fasting. Yeah, one of the most important times of the year for us. If you don't have a booklet, do we have any more back there? No, nobody's over there. Well, grab a booklet on your way out and use it during the week so that you can make the most of these 21 days. So we're a week in. I just want to encourage you to go all in. Maybe you haven't started it yet. That's fine. Don't worry about it. You got 14 days left, okay? Better 14 than zero, okay? Maybe you started something, and then you didn't keep up with it. And you're like, well, what's the point now? Well, there's a big point now, okay? You still have more time, okay? Don't give up now. There's no reason to quit now just because uh, you, you gave up a day or something like that, all right? So I just want to encourage you to make the most of it, to lock in. Uh, you really can. You can be pretty extreme for 21 days, okay? We're not asking you to do this all year, but hopefully what we do for these 21 days sets the tone. Uh, and the Lord really, really will and wants to speak to you in a unique and special way if you give him more time and attention. So this booklet has ideas, ways to fast, ways to focus your heart on the Lord. Uh, please make the most of this time. I promise you the Lord will not let you down. Mark your calendar. Just remember January 28th is Immerse, which is our all-day prayer and fasting from 9 to 9. Please join us throughout that day. Uh, and that night for a worship night and food together. And then January 29th, we're going to do baptisms uh, to celebrate. So if you know someone or if you need to get baptized, if you haven't taken that step yet in your walk, uh, please let us know, and we'd love to help you in that process uh, to do that on the 29th. So today we're going to be in Joshua, so go ahead and open your Bible to Joshua chapter 5. Let's go. Let's go. All right. Well, before we jump into that, I just want to give you a little uh, idea of where we're going. So the message today is called, Before the Walls Fall Down. Before the wall falls down. Before the wall falls down. What we're going to learn is the order of success and how to get and go about great victories that the Lord wants to have in your life. Listen, all of us start the year and we live lives with a ton of walls that are in our life, that are preventing things, that are... Uh, that are making us fearful, things that we need to get past or get over or find a way through. I mean, this is a very normal human experience. You've all started the year. You all sit here this morning with a wall in your life. It could be external. It could be internal. Something that's keeping you away from the vision God has for your life. And what I want you to see from this text today, how important the process is and the order of events that happen in Joshua before the wall actually comes down, and what we can learn from that about our own lives. And really, the idea here is that the 21 days of prayer and fasting is one of the ways and means by which God has given us to do before the victories come on the other side, the spiritual victories, the breakthroughs, the transformations, the answers to prayer, all these different things come about, but we need to know what to do before. We're so focused sometimes on the wall itself or on how it's going to come down or how the situation will change that we forget to focus on what we are supposed to do before. Before is the big word today, okay? Turn to your neighbor and say before, all right? I just want that word to be in your mouth. Say before, okay? We need to know what to do before. This is important for anyone who's ever bought anything from Ikea. You need to read the directions before you trip to build the product, all right? There's so many of us, especially the dads in the room, that are in a rush to get it done, and we hate every second of it, and we're just trying to figure out how to put this thing together. And I remember one time I bought a crib, and I did not read the instructions before, so I thought it's a crib. I've done this multiple times now. It's got these sides. It all makes sense. And I built it backwards. I built it backwards, and the things couldn't connect, okay, because they were on the other side. So I had these pieces, and it wouldn't connect. I had to take the whole thing apart. Because I did not read the instructions before I took on the mission. And this is what I want you to understand for your life. Or what are the instructions in the times, in the moments of your life that are before the mission, before the activity, before the breakthrough, before the wall comes down, before the change, before the resolution, before the answer, before the rest of the year what should we be doing before? 
And so many of us are focused on the after that we neglect to do the things we were supposed to do before. And the whole point of setting up the year with 21 days is to say we have to do what's right before so that the thing that needs to come after can come. Okay? You have to live your life in order. Otherwise, it won't work. So this is what I want to show you this morning. And I hope and I really pray that the Lord will use this to get you started in the right direction so that many walls can come down in your life and you can experience the life God has for you. So what are the instructions from before? Now we're going to read from Joshua 5, verse 13, all the way to chapter 6, verse 5. And we're going to pull out some principles for what it looks like then and how does that apply to our life today. So I'll start in verse 13. It says, when Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and he looked. And behold, a man was standing before him with his drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, are you for us or for our adversaries? And he said, no, which is not an answer, you know. It's totally what, what God would say. But I am the commander of the army of the Lord. Now I have come. Like, okay. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshipped him. And said to him, what does my Lord say to his servant? And the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, take off your sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did. Now, Jericho was shut up inside and outside because of the people of Israel. None went out and none came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, see, I have given Jericho into your hand with its king and its mighty men of valor. You shall march around the city, all the men of war going around the city once. Thus you shall do for six days. Seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. On the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. When they make a long blast with ram's horn, when you hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people will shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go up, everyone straight before him. This is the word of the Lord, and this is where we're going to stop for today. The context of this story is that Moses has passed off the leadership of Israel to Joshua. During Moses' life, they never actually made it to where they were supposed to go, i.e. the promised land. And this is part of the journey towards that destination and part of the property in that. And so now Joshua comes out of Moses' leadership. He's stepping into this role. And God has promised to give Joshua the land that he promised to Moses uh, to kind of fulfill what God has been doing there. So the first part, one of their main parts of their journey is this big city called Jericho. And it has huge walls around it. And obviously now they have encountered a great obstacle in their journey to go do what God has wanted them to do. And to take the land that God originally promised them. And so now Joshua is the leader of the people of Israel trying to figure out what to do and how to go about this attack. How to go about this next step in their journey is now consulting the Lord. And the Lord comes and he gives him this vision, and then he gives him direction, all right? So that's what God is doing. That's the situation that we're seeing here in the, in the time of the people of Israel. And what's important about this passage is because it's the buildup, it's the final uh, scene in the whole stage of preparation. So Joshua 1 through Joshua 5 is a time of preparation. It's doing different things to get you ready for Joshua 6. And so now the last thing we see before the wall falls down is this vision that Joshua gets from God. And so that's important for us to understand because this is essentially the last thing God wanted Joshua to know before he was going to go do and and fulfill the promise that he made to him originally. So I'm going to show you Uh, Three different things we see from this passage that you need to be doing also before the wall falls down. The first is this, is that vision before mission. Vision comes before mission. Vision before mission. Joshua gets a vision of who God is before he gets the mission of what God wants him to do. This is very important for our life. Joshua gets a vision of who God is before he gets a mission for what God wants him to do. He gets a revelation before he has a reaction. He gets to see before he has a strategy. He meets the person before he gets the plans. He has a meeting with God before he has a meeting with men. This is the right order. 
And the vision is not what your life is supposed to be like, okay? This is not how the world would describe vision. It's not a vision of the shot you're about to hit. I'm a golfer. You know, you're supposed to visualize the shot going straight. It never does, but that's what you're supposed to think it's about to do. You're supposed to visualize it, and visualizing is supposed to make it happen, okay? That's a worldly idea of vision. We don't need that kind of vision. We need a vision of God. And some of you are trying to visualize your life that you never caught a vision from God. You're trying to visualize your success. You're trying to visualize the breakthrough. You're trying to visualize the transformation. You're trying to visualize how to move forward. And what you need instead of visualizing your future is you need a vision of God. This is the, this is the final thing that Joshua gets before he's ready to go do the thing that God wants him to do. He gets a vision of God and what God is like. So the man presented here in the story as the commander of the armies of the Lord is also seen many times in reference in the Old Testament as the angel of the Lord, which is a reference to Jesus appearing before he comes in the New Testament. So it's just Jesus. This is who he's interacting with. This is why it gets clear. You say, how do you know that? Well, part of it is all the Bible study of, of the commander of the armies of the Lord, being the angel of the Lord. These things are connected. But then the main way you know this is he falls on the ground, he worships him, and the angel doesn't stop him. So you're going to see this all throughout the Bible. You start worshiping an angel, they say, no, 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 don't do that. That's not for me. I'm just, I, I'm like you, like I'm not the Lord. And this man, Joshua, gets down, he starts to worship him. And he doesn't stop him, which shows me right away, along with the other context, that this is the Lord. This is Jesus. And so Joshua now encounters a vision of Jesus. What's the vision of Jesus that Joshua gets before he goes into battle? Is it like, you know, we've had these ideas of Jesus before, like my homie Jesus, or Gandhi Jesus, or GQ Jesus, or my best friend Jesus, or my teddy bear hug Jesus, or, you know, meditate Jesus, or all these different ideas we have. No, no, no. What's the vision he gets of Jesus before he goes into battle? It's Jesus with a drawn sword. What's that going to do for your spirit before you go into war? This is so important that Joshua needed to see Jesus as he really is, before he goes into the mission that God has given him, before the mission of the battle, Joshua gets a vision of the Lord with a drawn sword. And this changes everything. This is why vision has to come before mission, but often we get this backwards. How many of us do this? We make our plans, and then we pray and ask God to bless them. That's backwards. That's mission before vision. We go out and we do something, and then we ask God to fix it or use it on the back end. We consult after the fact, but we never consulted before the fact. We trusted ourselves to do it, and then we realized how foolish that was, and we asked for mercy. And God is so kind. He comes through. He comes through. Praise God for his mercy, even though we're so foolish. But this is how we go about our life. We orchestrate the details of our lives to try to take down the walls in front of us, but we don't obtain the power of God that we need to do it. We're orchestrating, we're planning, but we're not obtaining the power. Why? Because we never got a vision before we went on the mission. Vision comes before mission. This is a simple reason why you cannot rush into your day. How in the world are you going to go about the mission of your day without first consulting and getting a vision of who God is? This is why it gets very simple. You say, man, I don't experience any peace today. And it's like, well, have you even seen the Lord? That could simply be a part of it to say vision comes before mission. My order of life is so important in this way. I can't make plans and then ask God to bless them. I need to get a vision of who God is and ask him what the plans are. What does Joshua do? He says, what do you want me to do? As soon as he realizes, oh, it's the Lord. This isn't a man. Or the, it's the Lord. He realizes it. There's a moment. And the, the next thing he says then is, okay, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? Vision has to come before mission. This is why we take these 21 days to say, Lord, we certainly have different ideas of what we'd like to do this year, but we're going to start with vision. We're going to start with an emphasis on prayer. We want to see you, and we need you to tell us, Lord, what do you want us to do? What do you want us to do? This requires order in your life. You can't live a life this way without prioritizing time to see the Lord, to hear from the Lord, to get in the Word, to be surrounded by people who love the Lord, to pray. 
Vision has to come before mission. Otherwise, your life will be lived backwards. So Joshua was there. It says in the text he was near Jericho. It doesn't say what he was doing. I could guess, you know, he's either probably praying. He might be strategizing. He might be getting depressed, looking at the wall and thinking, well, you know, what in the world am I supposed to do? Who knows? But he's there. And the point here is that right as he's looking at the wall, God meets him in that place. And boy, look at that. God meets him in that place. And this was his final means of preparation. How does the Lord prepare Joshua before he sends him into battle? He gives him his presence. What is God's means of preparation? It's his presence. And here's something for you to write down and consider in your life is that his presence is our preparation. His presence is our preparation. How does God want me to prepare to go into the battles of my life and to face the walls of my year and to go into these next days and to deal with the enemies in front of me and inside of me? How does the Lord want me to parent and lead and work? How do I prepare for all of these things? His presence is our preparation. God's greatest desire to get you ready is to come meet with you. But you have to be ready to meet with him. So Joshua, is, it's interesting here because Joshua and Moses both had the same means of preparation. You're going to see how their stories join together. Because if you know about the story of Moses, remember God calls Moses from the burning bush. And one of the first things God tells Moses to do is to take off his sandals for he's on holy ground. And then he calls Joshua, and what is one of the things he tells Joshua to do? Take off your sandals, you're on holy ground. What else happens? In the story of the burning bush, Moses receives his mission. Take off your sandals, you're on holy ground. You're meeting with the Lord. Here's a vision of who God is. Now here's the mission I want you to go accomplish. Now he looks at Joshua and says, take off your sandals, you're on holy ground. The Lord drawn with a sword. Here's a vision of who God is, and now I'm about to explain to you the mission you're going to go on. In both situations, vision comes before mission. In both situations, Moses and Joshua received their purpose in his presence. This is how important this is. They received his purpose in his presence, which is why maybe so many of you, you're watching online, you're here today, you're not following Jesus yet, and you feel like you're wandering around life. Why? Because you can only get your purpose when you are in his presence. Your purpose cannot come from your skills. Your purpose cannot come from your abilities. Your purpose cannot come from your traditions. Your purpose cannot come from your background. Your purpose cannot come from your ambitions, your dreams, your goals. Your purpose must come in his presence, for it is he who made you. He designed you. How in the world would you find out how you're supposed to live apart from the one who made you? And even my brothers and sisters in Christ in the room, how in the world are you supposed to live out your purpose without making time in his presence, without being aware of who God is, without acknowledging him being with you, without being in his word, without asking him to speak to you, without devoting time in prayer? How in the world are you supposed to walk out or even know the purpose of your life? If Moses gets his purpose in his presence, and if Joshua gets his purpose in his presence, how in the world would we be any different? Some of you aren't walking out the mission because you never took time to get the vision. And you're walking around purposeless and aimless because you don't give time for his presence. Let me tell you something about your life. Your life will be purposeless and powerless if it's presenceless. And I made that last word up, but it's there and it fit, okay? It's like, you know, sometimes Dr. Seuss got to make things up to make it rhyme, okay? So here I am. Your life will be purposeless and powerless if it's presenceless. Which is why, once again, not only these 21 days, but we take a significant portion of time throughout the year and different times in the year and weekly to gather in his presence, to fix our eyes on him. And so it should be with us. So maybe the first point is teaching you that you've been living your life backwards and you're putting mission before vision. But the thing that comes before the wall falls down is vision of God before the mission from God. So put your life in order. Get the preparation God wants for you. Receive the power and purpose from his presence. Okay, the second thing we see here is spiritual before physical. What are some instructions before the wall falls down? What are some of the realities at play? Well, this is important. 
And this goes along with the first point. Before the wall falls down, we have to see what is really going on. Okay? What's really going on in my heart? Why is that struggle so deep? Why is it so real? What's really going on in the life of my friend or family member? Why is that wall so high? What's really going on? What's really going on in my life, in my situation, in my surroundings? What's going on in the, in the kingdom of the world? What's the battle with the world and what's going on with the kingdom of God? Where is the real problem? Where is the real power? And listen, this is so important because the world you live in places these things in opposite order and probably puts the spiritual even farther back. But at the very least, the world you live in is going to prioritize the physical and is going to either neglect or make fun of or give real little devotion to the spiritual. So you're living in a world that says physical first, spiritual second, or like third, fourth, fifth, sixth, you know. That's the wind, that's the, the sea you swim in. But it goes the other way around. The world really works the other way around. Both these elements matter, but the Lord's going to give you a priority. Say spiritual before physical. There is a spiritual underlying issue in everything going on in the world. Everything is spiritual, even if it involves being physical. The real problems are spiritual. That's why Paul says we do not fight with flesh and blood. That's why Paul says we also, man, we bring down weapons of righteousness to take our spiritual weapons. This is the reality before us is that when we think about what's going on in our life, what's going on ahead of us, what are the walls that we need to see come down, what are the things we'd like to see transformed, what are the breakthroughs that we'd like to have, what, do we want, what does God want us to do, what does this look like, we get it wrong if we don't put the spiritual before the physical. We have to discern what's really going on here. I should ask that question a lot. What is really going on here and what is really going on with me? He's going to teach us this throughout this passage. A commentary I read said it this way, spiritual concerns, not military preparations, were to be of first importance to the Israelites in their task ahead. This principle, of course, is one that stands today. God wants our undivided loyalty and holiness. Spiritual before physical. Why do you think the Lord meets Joshua and tells him to take off his sandals, his shoes, because he is on holy ground? What does God confront Joshua with before he sends him on a mission he can see? He confronts, God, he confronts him with his holiness and says, the first thing you need to understand is the spiritual reality of holiness. The first thing you need to understand is who I'm really like. You need to see what's really going on here. You need to see what I'm really like. You need to open your eyes to the spiritual realm. And you cannot have discernment in the spiritual realm if you live with your mind constantly in the physical realm. You cannot. And you need discernment in the spiritual realm. I mean, think about it this way. Just simply put, I mean, things that are spiritual live forever. Things that are spiritual have more force. They have more longevity. They have more impact. They have more effect. And here's something for you to understand for your life. So Joshua meets with the Lord. His whole, God's holiness is revealed to him. An act of worship takes place. God, Joshua bows down before him. And then he gets sent on his mission. Here's something for you. You cannot take the battleground if you have not been on holy ground. You should live by this. You cannot take the battleground if you have not been on holy ground. What is God's preparation for Joshua to go into battle? It's for him to meet the Lord and be confronted with his holiness. Before you put on your shoes for war, you better take them off to worship is the point. Some of you are strategizing when you ought to be worshiping. Some of you are planning when you ought to be praying. You cannot take the battleground if you have not been on holy ground. And what is holy ground for us? Well, it's engagement with the Lord through the scriptures. It's times of prayer and devotedness to him. It's getting rid of all the noise and, and opening my ears to hear what God wants to say. It's getting around other believers and worshiping the Lord. It's running away from my sin and pursuing a life of obedience. You cannot take the battleground if you have not been on holy ground. And one of the most frustrating things for most of you is probably this, that you're trying to take battlegrounds without ever being on holy ground. Once again, you are putting mission before vision. It's fruitless, it's powerless, and that's why you end up so frustrated. How in the world are you going to take battlegrounds that involve spiritual realities, that involves powers that work beyond your, way beyond your capacity? How in the world are you going to take battlegrounds in the spiritual realm if you haven't been on holy ground to receive spiritual weapons. 
think how foolish it is. It's like if you gave Joshua a water gun. And we're like, okay, go, go fight, man. But that's what you're doing. That's what I do. Every day that I neglect holy ground, I'm basically taking, you know, a water gun to a gunfight. I'm using, we default, I use my worldly means, my worldly intellect, my worldly resources, my worldly strategies to bring about spiritual realities, to take down strongholds, to deliver, to see miracles, to transform, to see breakthrough, to change lives, to save souls. My money can't save a soul. Your intellect can't change a heart. You cannot take battleground if you have not been on holy ground. And you cannot win the real world if you don't fight with the real weapon. Some of you are planning and you ought to be praying. And that's part of the point here. Spiritual comes before physical. A simple thing, you know this, is you cannot win the game if you don't put in the practice. You see what I'm saying? You can't. How crazy would it be? Okay, I coach these little, I have a kindergarten team and a second grade team. All right? So my kids are on those teams. And this is how it always goes with those. You parents know. We don't have enough coaches to coach. And if we don't coach, nobody can play basketball, you know. You're just like, all right, you know, cool. I'll coach, you know. So I'm coaching a little basketball team of kindergartners and second graders. And they're back-to-back. And it's quite, it's, it's quite the operation, you know. Um, it, it's, it's just an interesting thing. I'm, you know, learning a lot. But you realize, you know, especially at that age, how much they don't know, you know, and how incapable they are of succeeding, you know, <laughs> without guidance. I mean, they just, they're just awful. I mean, they're just not very good. And, you know, they don't even, they're, they're learning the names of the lines, you know. You're like, what's the line over there? Like, oh. You know, we do that in practice. The sideline, baseline, free throw line, trying to help them learn, okay. They just pick up the ball and run like this. They just run around. <laughs> I'm like, guys, it's not football. This is not football. One kid, instead of when the pass comes to him, he just hits it. <laughs> I say, it's not volleyball, bro. Like, we're not playing volleyball. I have so many examples for them. They'll do defensive slides, but they'll just prance around, you know. Like, it's not the ballet, bro. We're not at the ballet. You guys look like ballerinas out here. Like, what is going on with you guys? I, they would not win a single game if we just went out there today, you know. They would not. But we've done two practices, and you know what? Hey, they've made a little progress. And if they keep practicing and keep practicing and keep practicing, sooner or later they'll start passing the ball chest high. They'll start shooting with the right form. They'll start understanding how the game works around them. They'll stop running with the ball like it's a football. They'll stop slapping it like a volleyball. And they'll stop dancing like ballerinas while they're out there. Eventually, if we practice. But if we don't put into practice, we can't expect to see any results in the game. It's so important for your life because so many of you are expecting winning results in the game without putting in the practice. You're expecting to take battleground without ever being on holy ground. You're expecting the Lord to speak to you without ever being in his word. You're expecting the Lord to empower you without ever praying for help. You're expecting the Lord to bless you while you live in constant disobedience. You're expecting the Lord to open a door when you haven't taken the first five he opened before. You need practice. You need to practice the spiritual realities at hand. Every day is an opportunity to practice growing more sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Every day is an opportunity to practice being more devoted to prayer. Every day is an opportunity to learn, Lord, teach me to pray. Every day is an opportunity to begin to get it right more and more and more. Every day is an opportunity to receive more instruction from the Lord. Every day is an opportunity, but you must put in the practice. And what I want you to understand, which is so important for us, is that you cannot take the battleground if you have not been on holy ground. You cannot expect winning results in the game if you don't put in the practice. This is true in your life. The benefit of being a Christian is you know the end result is a big W, you know. Even though I'm a mess up and I'm going to mess everything up, God's grace will overcome. But you cannot say, well, I win in the end, so it doesn't matter what I do now. No, Romans 6, Paul says, that's foolish. Do we sin a lot because grace abounds more? No. Do we not put in the effort because I know God wins anyways? No. No, 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 no. I put in the effort because I know I'm going to win. This is how it works. I want you to see this even more importantly. 
So I'm going to move back to the last five chapters. I'm going to summarize. Okay, what are the means of preparation? What kind of practice has the Lord given them to have spiritual sight, spiritual strength, spiritual power so that they can go act in this physical victory? What, what, what has happened? So Joshua 1, a new leader is introduced. This is Joshua. New leader, though, same God. That's why everyone's encouraged to say, okay, we got Joshua cool, but we got Jesus, we got the Lord, we got our Father, we got that, so we're good, same God. The next step is he sends spies in to go check out the land, this is the story of Rahab, they check it out. The next step is they cross the Jordan River miraculously, which is an amazing thing. They set up 12 stones to remember what God has done for them, and then God says, you must circumcise all the men of the camp. And so they had gotten away from the spiritual commitment made from Abraham on that the people of God in the Old Testament would be circumcised. This would be a mark of a covenant relationship to God. They had gotten away from that. And before they could go into battle, they had to get right with God. So God said, you need to get circumcised. This is the covenant I made with you. And then after that, they take the Passover to remember the exodus and when they left the land of Egypt to become free. And then after that, finally now Joshua gets a vision and then he gets instruction and then they take action. So there's this whole preparation process that the Lord is doing in their lives to set them up. Miraculous deliverance, emphasis on spiritual realities, a renewal of the covenant. This is all happening, and they're taking these steps one by one. And what I want you to understand in your life is that a great victory is set up by holy consistency. What do I need to do before? How do great victories and transformation and wall falling down, how does that happen in my life now, 2022? What does it look like for the Lord to provide and to break through? What does it look like to see the Lord act and do signs and wonders? How can I participate? What is my role in this thing that God is calling his kingdom and his work? Well, it's one of it is this, is that a great victory is set up by holy consistency. Introduce a new leader, follow and obey the Lord, set up the 12 stones, watch the Lord deliver miraculously, be circumcised, take Passover, get a vision from God, get his instruction, and then take action. This is what happens to Joshua, and this is how it is for us. Great victories are set up by holy consistency. It might take 10 acts of consistency to prepare for one victory. It might take 10 years of consistency to prepare for one victory. What we need to understand is that we just have to keep going because holy consistency is what is what sets up great victories. But some of us, because we lose faith, we lose endurance, we lose our purpose because we're not in his presence, we get doubting, we lack faith, and then we don't put in the consistency to see the great victory God wants to do. What I want to encourage you in your life today is to put in the consistency, to put in the practice, to devote yourself to the Lord every day, to ask for his help, because it takes holy consistency for you to see great victories. You're not just going to stumble into it. That's not how it works. So what does it look like for you to be wholly consistent? What are some of the things maybe you have given up on already that the Lord wants to renew and stir up in you? What are some of the things you are doubting that the Lord wants to renew faith for? What are some of the ways and habits that you have left aside that the Lord wants you to pick back up again? What does it look like to be wholly consistent? So that's the second thing, spiritual before physical. The final thing is this, clarity before crazy, all right? You're like, what does that mean? Here's what it means. Here's what it means. You need clarity from God. So you can have conviction and courage to do what is crazy to men. You need clarity from God so you can have the conviction and courage to do what is crazy to men. This is so important. I'm going to say it. You need clarity from God. Why? So you can have conviction and courage. Why do you need conviction and courage? Because he's going to ask you to do what's crazy. And if you don't have clarity, you won't have conviction and courage. And if you don't have conviction and courage, you won't do what is crazy. And if you don't do the crazy thing God asks you to do, then the wall never falls down. You see? what? The wall falling down is on the other side of them looking foolish. The wall falling down is on the other side of ridiculousness. The wall falling down is on the other side of craziness. You see what happens? These instructions are wild. They're going into battle, and he's like, yo, put the worship leaders up front. Get DDA up here, bro. He'd sing his way around, you know. I want my soldiers to walk around quietly. 
And I want some fellas to grab some trumpets. Like what? You know, we read the Bible as if we're so spiritual. Like, oh, of course I trust God to do that. These instructions are crazy. We're going to go into battle. We're going to take the city. Yeah, okay. Here's the plan. Just walk around. Just take a lap. Just take a lap. Just take a lap. And, you know, put the soldiers in the back. Okay, get your drummer. Get your bassist, okay? Put them in the front. Aubrey's like, oh, they're going to die first. <laughs> they're going to die first. <laughs> tough. It's tough for them. No, he's like, this is the way I want you to do it. And I just want you to sit for a moment and think about, okay, okay. These instructions don't make any sense, okay? Just like Ikea. They don't make any sense. Now, I don't know how to use them. And if I act on these instructions, I will look foolish to them. I mean, imagine you have to play this out. They're walking around the city for seven days. Every day, the people in the city can see them. If I was there, I'd be like, <laughs> I'd just be laughing, you know? Like, they don't know God's all, you know, they don't, they don't, aren't ready for that. And they're just walking around and be like, ah, boo, you know? You know, get your steps in today. What does your Apple Watch say? You know, like, they would be mocked. They would be mocked. Can you imagine after, like, the third day, you just kind of be like, what are we doing? They're looking around to each other, you know? Let's get real. This is what you and I would be like, like, what are we doing? Wow, let's get this Joshua guy out of here. He's got the dumbest ideas, you know? Like, this doesn't work. And you know how often you and I feel just like that? We say, the Lord has given us instructions, and the world's like, that's crazy. They're going to start mocking and say, oh, you look so foolish. And then you do look foolish. And then you're walking around three days, ten years of your life. You haven't seen the resolution yet. You still look foolish. And on the fourth day, the fifth day, the fourth year, the fifth year, trying to pray your way to victory, and the Lord hasn't answered yet, and people start to say, oh, just like with Noah, that fool's building an ark. What kind of dummy would do that? See so how many times in the scriptures God tells you to do something crazy? Noah built an ark for 100 years. And every day people made fun of him. Every day. So why would you do that? That's crazy. Why would your plan be to walk around the city? That's crazy. Can you imagine Joshua taking this plan to his soldiers and his leaders? Okay, everybody gather around. They're ready. Yeah, we're going to take the promised land. Okay, what's the Lord going to do? Is he going to, like, shoot lightning bolts out of the sky? Like, what's he going to do? He's like, okay, here's the plan, guys, fellas, my strong soldiers. Here's the plan. All right, we're going to walk around the city. Okay, then what? Then we're going to walk around it again. Okay, what are we going to do after that? We're going to walk around it again. Okay, what next? And then we're going to walk in, and then again. Okay, 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 okay. That's weird. Then what? Then we're going to blow some trumpets. Then what? Then the wall's going to fall down. You're like, what? What? Can you, I mean, get in Joshua's suit for a second. That whole place isn't like filled with faith. Like, oh, yeah, you know, like, yeah, the Lord can do that. They're just like us. Like, that's the dumbest plan I ever heard. Like, why would you do that? And they're walking around. Imagine Joshua. And so they get to Joshua, and he tells them this. He's like, okay, we're going to blow some trumpets. The wall's going to fall down. And I imagine they look at him, and they say, who told you that? This is where vision comes in. Who told you that? Who told you to walk around the city and blow some trumpets? Was that Gandhi? Is this the way of peace? Are we setting a peace treaty? Who told you that? Was that Rihanna? Are we singing a song? Are we making a new song? What kind of person would give you that kind of advice? And he says, I saw the Lord with a sword drawn ready to fight. That's who told me that. Whoa. Who told you that? The Lord. What did he look like? He didn't look meek and mild. He had a sword drawn, and he was ready to fight. That's who told me that. He said to walk around the city because the Lord's going to fight for you. Some of you have this domesticated view of Jesus. Or you think the being in his presence is goosebumps and good vibes. Where I just want to feel good and have some spiritual energy. Jesus gives me big hugs and takes away my anxiety. And helps me feel secure. Which certainly he does those things. He's very wonderful and kind and gracious to us. 100%. But there's also a Jesus with a drawn sword. Ready to fight. And some of you are taking your meek and mild Jesus, which is beautiful and wonderful. But you've missed the war, Jesus. And you thought his presence was just good vibes when his presence is preparation for battle.
And if you're seeking the presence of God so that you feel a certain way in a worship service or so that you have a certain feeling about yourself or so that you have some spiritual energy running through your body, you're just like the world. That's not what it's for. The presence of God is preparation for the battles ahead. It's training. This is what he says. Who told you? Who told you that? And he says, the Lord draw him with the sword. And think about that in our life. You say, oh, he can't, you know, he has to be pure. He can't have sex before marriage. And you say, who told you that? You look foolish. That's stupid. Why would you live that kind of way? Who told you that? You say, well, the one who made my body, that's who told me that. You say, I should just do whatever I want. Who told you that? TikTok. For real, you laugh, but so now I can choose. I can either live according to TikTok or live according to the maker of my body. Who told you that? The Lord said, deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. If you lose your life, you will save it. So now you walk around. Giving your life away. He said, if you get hit, man, turn the other cheek. If somebody asks you to go one mile, take two. Totally just give your life away. Don't look out for yourself. Give your life away. Somebody says, who told you that? Who told you you should keep making so many sacrifices? Even Christians will tell you this. Why would you be so extreme? Why would you be so crazy? And they think, who told you to live that way? And you say, man, the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth, the one who made me knows how my life should go. You say, you say you should take a comfortable route. Who told you that? Who told you that? Who told you you should not deny yourself? Who told you you should live for yourself? Well, the world did. The news channel did. Social media did. So once again, who are you going to live by? Whose vision are you going to live by? You see how important vision is? Because if you don't have a vision of God, you will live according to a vision from the world. And you need to see the Lord. Because you need confidence. Because if you're going to live for him for real, for real, people are going to say you're crazy. People are going to make fun of you. They're going to think you're foolish. They're not going to listen to you. And you're going to have years sometimes of mocking you and of not seeing it come through and the prayer not getting answered. And the question then at that point is, are you still seeing him? Because if you still see him, you still have a vision of him to say, man, this battle isn't going like I want. But I saw the Lord with the sword drawn and he fights for me. This battle in this way isn't going how I want. But I saw the Lord dying on the cross who shed his blood for me. I can trust him. This battle or this way isn't going how I want. I haven't got the answer yet, but I saw an empty tomb. And the Lord is alive today. You cannot, you cannot, you cannot, you cannot, you cannot live the way the Lord wants you to without seeing him the way he wants you to. You need to ask that question a lot. Who told you that? And you need to think about it. Who told you you should live a certain way? Who told you you should be so crazy? Who told you this was the best way to be happy? Who told you this was the best way to be successful? Who told you that if you get more, you feel better about yourself? Who told you these things? And if you don't have a vision of God for what he really is, then you will believe the vision from the world. And you will not have the courage or the conviction to do what is crazy. And if you don't do what is crazy, the wall will not fall down. This is important. Clarity before crazy. You need clarity from God so you can have conviction to do what's crazy before men. Here's something else that you need. Preparation is needed because patience is required. Not one, like LeBron James, right? Not one, not two, not three, not four, but seven days, seven tries. Patience is required, so they need the preparation of his presence. They had to look foolish for seven days. And like I said, you may have to look foolish for seven years. You need to prepare because patience will be required. If you do not get the preparation of his presence, you will not have the desire and the drive to keep going. All right, the final thing I want you to see here from this passage is from the verse 1 in chapter 6. It says here, in some versions, I like this phrasing, Jericho was tightly shut up. It says nobody went in or out. Right? It's sealed. It's tightly shut up. 
And this is the narrative God gives to set up what he's about to do. He does this as well when they cross the Jordan River. The word in chapter 3, verse 14, it says, the Jordan overflows its banks, meaning it's a very strong river. Why does he give that information? So that you're more in awe of when he parts the river and lets the people walk through. Why does he say, oh, it's really tightly shut up? So that you understand the level of difficulty, so that you could see the level of God's power. Let me encourage you now as you enter into this year, this is true then and this is true today, that a great obstacle is just an opportunity to see the greatness of God. Oh, come on. A great obstacle is just the opportunity to see the greatness of God. The wall might be tightly shut up. It might be hard to get in. The difficulty level might have ramped up ten times. Things might be sealed off from you. Hearts are getting harder. Situations are getting more difficult. The walls are getting higher. It looks more difficult than it did before. And instead of going to great despair, what you should do is have great hope. Because the greater the obstacle, the greater the opportunity to see the greatness of God. This is what he presents in front of us, is it's a setup. It's a setup. Why is it so tight? Because it's a setup to see how easy God knocks the wall down. It's a setup. Why is this situation so hard? It's a setup for you to see the power of God. Why is this getting more difficult? Why? It's a setup to make you more like Jesus and then see his miraculous deliverance. It's a setup. And you don't know, it might not be a setup for a long time. And it might take you, like I said, seven days or seven years or 70 years to see the Lord come through in the way that you ask. But we see this all throughout scripture. Is God makes a situation more difficult and he presents it as really bad and worse just so he could show how great his power is. Ultimately, this is true on the cross to say the divide between you and me is impossible, between you and God and me and God is impossible to make up. Our sins have mounted up to the sky. We are held liable for what we have done before God. Our sins have made us deserve wrath and punishment from God. This is an impossible breach to make. We cannot jump our way to the other side. I can't work hard enough, be nice enough, be helpful enough, go to church enough. Give money away enough. Serve the poor enough to get into heaven. It is impossible for me to make this thing work. The situation is dire. It's difficult and it's impossible, but not for the Lord. Ultimately, we see God's the greatest obstacle in your life is your sin has separated you from God. But that's simply a setup for you to experience the greatest opportunity, which is salvation through Jesus Christ. Your sins are great, yes they are, so are mine. Your sins deserve God's eternal wrath, so do mine. But Jesus has come and has paid the price for your sins. Jesus has died and risen again. And today's the opportunity you have to put your faith in him. But some of you are so tightly shut up against the Lord, just like Jericho. I've been talking about the walls in front of us, but you need to realize the walls inside of us. You're tightly shut up against the Lord and your heart is getting hard and you're trying to keep him out of your life. You're trying to keep him away from his advance. However, I want to let you know this. You cannot make yourself strong enough to withstand God's advance. One day, without a doubt, your lips will say he is Lord. The wall that you have held up against God will come down. It will come down. It will come down. You cannot maintain it over a lifetime. One day, either by force or freely, you will say Jesus is Lord. And the wall that you have tightly shut up against him will come out, will fall down. And what I want you to understand today then is you have the opportunity like the people of Jericho did to say, well, you know what? We're going to lose this battle, so I'm going to come out and see if I can get an agreement for peace. I'm instead of holding my ground and keeping my wall, I'm going to walk out and ask for peace. And that's what some of you need to do today is to say, instead of holding this wall, instead of holding my heart against God, instead of holding my life in my hands, instead of holding and trying to keep God out, I don't want God as Lord in my life. I want to do what I want. Instead of holding on to that wall and then waiting till you fall, till your life falls down in death, and then the penetrate, the God comes forward and advances on you in wrath. Instead of waiting for the moment where God comes in angry, you have today to walk out of that wall and ask for peace. 
And God's waiting for you. He has a peace agreement already made ready. There's a peace treaty between you and God. His name is Jesus. And if you'll come out from behind that wall, you can have peace with God. And you can have eternal life in his presence. So today's the day I encourage you to come out from behind that wall. Stop holding it because one day it will come down. And I want it to come down now while you can do so freely instead of later when he comes by force. You are tightly shut up against the Lord, but there is a door being opened to you today to walk out and to accept the agreement of peace God has made with you by putting your faith and trust in him. And I ask you to do that today. And so many of you as well, my brothers and sisters in Jesus, you are building walls against what the Lord has wanted you to do. Walls of disobedience, walls of no, walls of a lack of faith. And I want to encourage you today, instead of keep building that wall, to start your 21 days by coming out from behind the wall and getting right with God. So, we need vision before mission. We have to put the spiritual before the physical. You need to get some clarity before so you can be crazy to do what God wants you to do. Take these 21 days to make sure you do the right things before so you can see the right things God wants to do after. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you so much. Lord, we thank you that you're such a miracle working God, Lord, all throughout the Bible, just over and over again. You come through for your people. But we have a role to play, Lord. We have a role to play in what you do in the world. We have a role to play in how things go in our life. We have a role to play, and I pray that you would, as the song said, stir us up unto that, Lord. I pray that we would be a people marked by your presence, that your presence would prepare us, that we would get vision, Lord, before we take on the mission. Give us courage, Lord, so that we can live crazy before people, God. Help us to see the spiritual realities at at play in our lives and in those around us. And I pray, Lord, I pray, I pray, I pray for anybody in this room or watching online that they would come out from behind that wall and that they would make peace with you through trusting in Christ. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Why don't you stand? Let's respond to the Lord.